It's funny. I, I feel like I really know your apartment because of the, I just, you know, I read Penny and it's like so much of it is like, well, it's basically almost all taking place like right there in your apartment. So it's funny to actually see it. Oh yeah. But are you in, yeah. in, in Boston or, or something or what? Oh yeah. Yeah. We're in downtown Boston. Did you ever have to do like mainstream comic shows or did you stick to um, the stuff? Like have to, I mean, I've, I've uh, done them. I mean, I've done the, I, I did the Boston comic-con back in the day. I mean, like, I, I mean, I haven't done it since probably 2012, mm -hmm. um, which is, I mean, which is kind of ironic because they have moved like downtown, like they used to be like in a different location, but like now it's like literally like a two minute walk from my house, the, the convention center where they have it every year. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, yeah, it's just so, I mean, you know, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll probably start doing it again now that uh, Penny is out because that's, mm -hmm. that's like a broader, uh, more marketable book, I think, for that kind of audience. So, and have there have there been any reviews of Penny yet? Uh, just two so far. Um, you know, it's still pretty early. Um, yeah, it's just it hasn't even come out in stores yet, right? No, it's not coming out until April twentieth. Okay. So, um, yeah, it just publishes weekly and book list. So, do you get nervous about that stuff? No about, like, reviews and everything. You you don't read your Goodreads page. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the one that, you know, I mean, all the other, I mean, th that's the only place where I get bad reviews, if I'm going to brag. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just people on Goodreads. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's been pretty good. I mean, it's, it's like, it's a 4.1 so far, so. That's great. I know, I know that. 4.1, 4.136. <laughs> I loved it, man. I thought it was really great. I was well, wondering about like that because one of the things I really liked about it was that, and I think this has to do with the origin of it, was that you can read a page and it's like a, a page is almost like a self-contained uh, strip, you know, like you can actually just take one page of it and publish it somewhere and it'll stand on its own. But then together they make up like a longer narrative. And I heard or I read about the, how, where it came from and it was like you were doing it in the Village Voice or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's, that's true. I did it for six months. Um, and it started in the fall of 2016. And it was because of uh, Spurgeon. Uh, Tom uh, was a scout for them because uh, they wanted to start publishing comics again. And he had given them like a list of names. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on that list. Actually, I still remember the email. Uh, you know, he he basically said that he was doing that and that they paid a thousand dollars a strip and would I be interested? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So yeah. So like I, I quickly like, you know, came up with something, but it like wasn't any, um, it was, well, they, I like went down there for a meeting like with the editors and, you know, it was, it was really like out of some, it was like a Woody Allen movie like that scene in Annie Hall when uh, that like old comedian is oh, trying yeah. to, <laughs> it was like that, yeah. was, you know, they were like, uh, so yeah, um, we like want you to like do something that's kind of like hip and cool. I mean, have you, um, have you been down to like Brooklyn? I mean, apparently there's like something going on in Brooklyn, you know, it's like 2016. Oh God. <laughs> you know, like write about, you know, you know, just like find out like what's going on there. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm, you know, like 36, 37. <laughs> and also I live in Boston. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but, you know, but like I, I, I did something similar for years because I mean, you know, I was a weekly cartoonist for the Boston Phoenix, which was the Village Boys of Boston for like seven years. So, you know, I just, I just hacked something out about, you know, people like young people trying to pay rent and uh, they rejected it. They were like, well, you know, like we're, we're like thinking of something that, you know, could appeal more broadly, you know, something that like women would like. <laughs> they actually said that. So like I asked my wife, you know, I asked Alex, so it's, you know, um, what do women like? 
And she's like, well, why don't you just do something about Penny? You know, like do something about cats. Cause you know, cats were popular in 2016. So I just started doing it and, you know, and like they went for it. Hold on a second here. Carl, there's 153 pages in this book. You mean to tell me you made $153,000 worth of this book? <laughs> no, 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 no. Because like the strip only lasted uh, six months. And then, and then the boys started publishing like, you know, like maybe three or four months after that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I did 20. So I, I made $20,000. And nice. actually <laughs> that was, we like used that as a, as, a, as a down payment to like buy this apartment. So what, so because the strip was running in the paper, is that what attracted Chronicle to you? No. So like an idiot after it stopped running, I just kind of shelved it and just started working on my own, you know, uh, navel gazing auto bio projects. Um, and it wasn't until, um, I guess the end of 2018, um, I'd done a book with retrofit called the winner and I was at mice, the convention in Cambridge here. And I was sitting next to this cartoonist, Marika Makula, and I, I had made um, like a mini comic of the penny strips, you know, just this like 24 page thing. And she's like, wow, you know, like, this is really good. Like, I know somebody at Chronicle, you should probably get an agent and pursue this. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I guess so. So, um, so I, you know, found an agent, uh, Meg Thompson, who's uh, Tom Hart's agent, actually. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, and like, you know, she knew people at Chronicle, so she pitched it, and, like within a couple of weeks, I like had a deal. And they were like, you know, I mean, they just gave me like free reign. It was, um, they like really like left me alone. And I was very happy about that. So, yeah, but, but, but I mean, you know, I had like 10 months to do um, like 120 pages. So, which is a lot for me, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. And then um, you had to basically come up with a larger story, right? I mean, you, when you were yeah. doing the paper, you weren't thinking about it as a book, I would assume. No, no, like not at all. I mean, because it because it was born out of like a, you know, weekly comic strip thing, I, I thought to keep it that, but also just try to expand it ever so slightly by doing like shorter stories within it. I mean, that's that's the way, like the last few books have been designed that way where they were just single page stories that slowly built up to like a larger story. So mm -hmm. I decided just to, you know, continue doing that. So, which has been like the bane of my existence. I mean, since I started doing the weekly strip for the Phoenix back in 2005, because uh, like before then I had won a zero grant to do this uh, longer story. Mm -hmm. uh, called guilty and you know I was 25 like 26 and like I was like at the time you know I was thinking okay like I'm, I'm going to be a graphic novelist you know I'm going to write these long stories you know and that's going to be my like mode as a cartoonist but then when I was offered that job to do a weekly strip I, I first of all had to figure out how to do it you know how to write like jokes mm -hmm. and you know, luckily they were like patient with me. And so, but I feel that did something to my creative process. It, it's like slowed me down or it just made me uh, very self-conscious about writing like longer strips. And I just became the strip cartoonist and it was hard for me to like write longer stories. Like I, I had a lot of, you know, starts and stops. So, and, I don't know, it was, it was like very frustrating. So I had to like develop a way to like turn that into like longer narratives, just be satisfied with just like writing each scene as like one or two page strips. So I don't know, like now we're getting into the weeds of my psyche. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, you started off, uh, wait, did you, you're an art student, right? Did you go to art school? Yeah, I did for two semesters, um, but my family was pretty broke so they couldn't, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't even get student loans to <laughs> continue. So. Yeah, but how um, are you classically trained? I mean, you, you clearly are, right? I mean, are you no. Just... Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I had like that foundation year. I mean, it's it's just from like studying. I mean, like my my like day job after after I dropped out of school 
was uh, working at the Harvard Art Museums. Mm -hmm. And they have like a pretty, you know, I was a guard. Mm -hmm. And so basically my job was to stand in an art gallery for six or seven hours a day. So, you know, I would study the collection and, you know, I, I stayed friends with one of my old painting professors and, you know, like he, you know, like he would give me stuff to read or point me in the direction of, you know, people to look at. So, I mean, you know, I, I kind of pieced it all together, you know, much like being a cartoonist. Um, your first book was Guilty, right? It was a Zarek? Was, book. yeah. Did you have any mini comics before that or was that really your first? Oh, comic? yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I was I was way deep in the comics, like from a very early age. And I started doing mini comics when I was a teenager, you know, like little local cons, like in the 90s, like in the suburbs of Boston and, you know, a, a couple of them in Boston. And like, you know, I, I would sell them. And, you know, I was I was very, very plugged in. You Did know. people think like, oh, look at this cute kid selling comics. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But I mean, you know, I was dead serious about it, you know. I, I, I was really, I mean, I was reading like the comics journal, you know, uh, you know, hate. I mean, like anything I could get my hands on that, you know, told me like how to like pursue this like career, you know, I was very single-minded. So. And did you, is that where you found out about the Zarek Grant was like in the pages of the comics journal? Cause they would always have, like an ad for the Zarek Grant. Yeah, it was either that or like Cerebus. Like, you know, I, I, I bought that out of habit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I've it's, never it's, read Cerebus, but it's like, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like uneven. I mean, it's something, you know, he did it for 20 years. I mean, you know, it's, it's really, you know, like, like the bad parts are really bad, but like the good parts are, you know, good. I mean, you know, like he's, he's really, you know, like what he did, you know, with like lettering and like, you know, panel composition. I mean, all like the formal stuff is, I think, pretty genius, but. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's like all that baggage with him. So, mm -hmm. you know, hard yeah. to talk but about. Like it, the third, but the third but, person I had on who like really likes uh, Cerebus, you know, that guy who does Bubbles, that zine. Oh, yeah. He's like a big fan of Cerebus and Steve Bissett, of course. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's how, I mean, because like back in when I was, you know, a kid, like reading it, like, you know, he would have people like Steve Bissett, like in the back, you know, he like ran, you know, like Tyrant. I mean, like they're all friends, you know, cause like it was, you know, like in the late eighties, early nineties, they're all part of that creator bill of rights thing that uh, helped a lot of cartoonists um, get, you know, like better royalties at Marvel and DC. And, you know, it's like very like instrumental with like helping out artists within the industry. So, um, but you know, like he, he in the, in like the back of Cerebus, there would be all those like previews of like comics that were coming up, and you know, I that's really like how I learned about like a lot of indie comics. Or did you when you were, were trying to get the Zarek Grant, were there failed attempts before you actually got one, or was it? Um, yeah, I mean, like I tried a couple times, um, and um, but actually, I mean, I used I I like knew um, one of the. Uh, uh, Steve Murphy, who was um, like a writer of like the Ninja Turtles. Mm. And I mean, I would go to Northampton a lot, um, you know, like when I was a teenager, because like where I grew up was like not that far from there. So as soon as I got a license. Hmm? You knew Steve Murphy? Yeah. Uh, because the like, yeah, the like Poom Blues guy. Oh, wow. And, awesome. Yeah, because like in the late, uh, like in the 90s, he or like, I guess it was part of the late nineties. He like had this all weekly uh, paper called the VMAG, short hmm. for uh, Valley Mag. And, you know, it was distributed in Northampton, Amherst. And I like met him at a convention there where I was like selling my mini comics. And actually that was a crazy convention. It was at the Hotel Northampton, but uh, so he was there, uh, um, like Peter Lyard was there uh, selling his, you know, uh, what was the name of it? Was it, was it the Planet Racers? It was some, post turtles thing um but um like bernie wrightson was there <laughs> and they're all just kind of like sitting around me it was you know completely crazy but like um uh, but i talked to steve at that show i mean you know i was fucking like 18 or 19 and he's like oh wow you know like i really like your comics would you be interested in doing a weekly comic for us wow so like, fuck yeah so like you know that was like my first published work was was in there but you know but i would like hand deliver it i would like can deliver uh, my strips every every week, 
and we sit and chat like you know he'd tell me stories about you know whatever like the comics industry because wait you know, he, how old were you at the time when you did that uh like 18 damn like, that's amazing man yeah yeah it was great i mean you know, he was really like he was really kind to me um but you know but the um the words and pictures museum was there at the time i mean or may have just closed um but like i mean we would go there like my friends and i you know at least once or twice a month you know did you ever meet uh michael zuli no oh man he was I cool i, I met him one time i met him at uh i did the denver comic-con and he was a special guest there and they had him and i on a panel for some reason <laughs> oh really I was, I was like 27 years old i think i just had the hypo had just come out from fanographics my first book mm -hmm. and i'm talking to this guy like i didn't even really know who he was at the time you know but he's just yeah. he looked like a wizard he had like a cane and stuff and uh, like, <laughs> like cool. long flowing clothing and stuff and long wow. beard and everything and, and uh i was just like entranced by this guy i'm like who is this guy like this is a comic artist like he seems like it's so like you didn't know his work i didn't know his work but he had like just self-published something through kickstarter um some personal project and it was great and uh, then i learned more about him he was like you know he was a sandman artist and stuff and he did puma blues and some ninja turtles comics yeah. And stuff. and yeah, yeah and I, I was like this guy's great uh and then now like oh you know and as i get older and stuff like i at least once a year now i, I look back on his on his uh stuff you know he's it's, it's really interesting and you know he's more than a comic artist he's more than a cartoonist i guess yeah definitely i completely agree i mean actually i was looking at those ninja turtles issues um not too long ago and the idw books or do you have the original issue no I, um i bought the issues oh okay so, yeah That's and cool. um yeah they're they're really you know quite i mean they're just super intense i mean he's he's a really good storyteller but the um because on technique you know it's, it's so like hatch heavy and mm -hmm. But, 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 you know, he made the turtles like super realistic, you know, like how, how they would look if they were like, you know, like mutated. <laughs> it was like, it was weird kind of human like faces. And yeah. Did he do uh, on the new turtle stuff? Did he use that tint board where you add the chemical? Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, have you ever used that? I've never used it. I've never used it because it was past my time. I, I really started trying to make my comics look professional in like 2006. And that's no, you couldn't find that stuff anymore. Oh yeah, yeah, that was long gone. I mean, I, I got some like Zipatone like yeah you know, back in the day, and it was like Manga that. Studio. Like you'd go to like the art store, they'd be yeah. a little spinning rack of like different patterns you could get because you if you wanted to be like a manga artist, and they'd yeah. be, like a a pattern that'd just be like a, a living room or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like who the fuck is using this? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a really tempting to like, you know, do something like 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 with that like with all those weird pa patterns yeah yeah but i mean like who <laughs> i mean i wonder if like comics exist that like actually have that like generic background i mean i, I guess they must, right? there was i i bought some that i still have that's all it was was a crowd of people walking in the background wow. and it's in three different sizes and i still have it because I, I bought it because i was like this is weird and it was probably on sale at the time and then i i never used it i never found a, a way to or did i use it i might have used it in my retrofit comic now that i think about it I used a lot of Zipatone, but the problem with that was that it turned out like a it was like a moray pattern when I used Zipatone in this one comic. So ever since then, I've done like digital Zipatone. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, it's like a weird look. I don't know. I've 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 never really even gotten into it. It's I don't know. It's like too like mechanical or looking or something. But, but if it, somebody said, "Hey, Carl, we want you to do this mini comic, and we want it, it black and white with Zipatone." Wouldn't you be kind of interested in that challenge? Like, oh, all right, well, let's try and mess yeah, with Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if someone put a gun to my head, to... <laughs> <laughs> or like maybe not a gun, but if someone politely asked me. I got a little bit off track. I wanted to know about what the uh, comic scene was like when you put out Guilty, your first book. In 2005? Yeah. Um, it was it was still pretty, pretty small. Um, I mean, it's, it seemed that way to me. Um, uh, Jeff Mason uh, distributed it for me. I mean, I remember when it came out, I, I approached, you know, D&Q and Fanta and asked everyone if they'd be interested in distributing it. And 
uh, Jeff like immediately said that he would. So, um, so he would give me table space at Mocha and SPX. Mm. And so, um, you know, I mean, I guess everyone's just younger. I mean, it, it's, it's all the same people that we know. I mean, you know, um, like, uh, Gabriel Bell mm -hmm. is around Lauren, um, Weinstein. Yeah. I don't think of like who else I, I mean, it's like, you know, just name like a middle-aged cartoonist and, you know, yeah, it was them, but they were younger. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember, you know, like Julia and like Sarah had oh, like yeah, pizza Island. Yeah. Yeah. The pizza Island stuff. Um, you know, <laughs> like, I remember like, I remember like drinking, you know, of course a lot, yeah. um, you know, and I think it was like Stumptown one year, it might've been 2007. Actually it was next to Tom K and Sarah and Julia were like down the, there were a few tables down and like, you know, Julia was, uh, she had like a bottle of whiskey. She was like passing it around. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. She yeah. I mean, yeah. People and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, but I, I only say that because she's also sober now too, but it was, you know, I mean, that's all like I remember is just going to parties and being a jackass. Were you talking about the incident that led to the end of your newspaper strip? Oh, the, the Phoenix one? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Boston Phoenix, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah the Boston Phoenix. Um, yeah, well, they, the art director, um, uh, sat me down for a meeting and said that one of my strips offended uh, a potential advertiser. And I was like, well, how did that happen? And um, they were like, well, I guess, you know, it like, got through the editor. And I was like, well, which strip was it? And she said, well, it was the one where you, uh, in like one of the panels, uh, compared drinking Bud Light to drinking uh, horse piss. Ooh. And uh, we were trying to get Budweiser to be an advertiser. So uh, we decided that we don't want to have this risk anymore if you, you know, potentially offending an advertiser. So we're cutting the strip. That sounds like bullshit yeah. to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they just didn't want to pay me the $125 they were paying me <laughs> anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, which is fine. I mean, I, um, I was I, like, more I, I, I just got to say real fast that, that bothers me that you made $125 because I also did a weekly comic strip for seven years and I made $75 a week doing it. I didn't know that you could make $125. Dude, I told you I'm making a thousand. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, uh, like Lauren had a strip too, like, you know, like while I had a strip, but like, you know, but, I mean, I get the full back page, but like, you know, she had like a, like a smaller strip. Well, it was, it was printed smaller, but she was getting half. She was only getting 500, but still. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you good. But yeah, I mean, you should have asked for more money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. From the Denver westward. Yeah. But like, didn't you do one in Columbus too? I, I remember. I, I remember did. Yeah. But that was also 75. Okay. But yeah, that, I don't know. I just, I, I, I felt fortunate to even have a strip in the paper, you know? And yeah, no, I mean, it's it's exciting to see it in print, you know? Um, well, I, I remember talking to Keith Knight about this back in the day. Actually, he's someone that I talked to a lot back in the mid to late aughts. And, you know, he was very good about uh, getting into a lot of papers. Yeah. You know, he was, he just told me his like whole system of, you know, just set, like sending out like photocopies to like editors you know, he would do it like at least once a month, just send out packets and yeah. like just build up like a lot. So, you know, he would have like whatever, like 20 or 30 papers that ran a strip and, you know, they probably paid him like a range between whatever, like $25 to, well, who knows? So that's how he was able to do it. But I was, I was too lazy and like too drunk to like do that. <laughs> and well, like not broad enough, I guess. I cut you off though. You so they said like we're gonna cancel your strip because we were trying to get Budweiser to be a sponsor and you pissed off Budweiser. Yeah. So like that was the excuse. And so I was like, okay, you know, sorry. And um, but they're like, well, we'll like still use you as an illustrator. It's like, okay, yeah, sure. 
so then you know i got drunk and started like complaining on facebook <laughs> it blew up and then actually it was like kind of funny because like one of the, the like boston globe the, the big daily here they one of the reporters um saw it or somebody linked to it on or like you know showed him like what would happen so he like contacted me to like ask if like that was true that i was being censored because every year the the boston phoenix would do um this big story about the like top 10 um uh, censored stories from like local media mm -hmm. so you know here was the phoenix censoring one of their own so like the so like the globe wanted to point out that hypocrisy so you know of course i talked to the reporter because i was pissed off and then so and they you know ran like a little paragraph you know phoenix censors cartoonist <laughs> oh man and it was like really pissed off like that the editor from the phoenix and it completely blackballed me you know so like all that illustration work i was promised of course i didn't get but then the phoenix went you know they they went out of business like six months later so yeah they stopped watching in 2013. yeah is that a dead thing now do you think that you could still be a cartoonist for alternative weekly somewhere or do you think it's uh, no <laughs> i mean down here i mean maybe i mean you know i i feel like some cities well like the austin chronicle i think is doing pretty well um it just depends on the city but i mean i don't think you could live i mean i don't think you ever could you know um i mean maybe back in the 80s or something i mean did like linda berry or matt graining like were they able to Make yeah, Linda Berry did very well from it. And she she kept going until I think it was down to like just a few papers. And then she just said, forget it, it's not worth it anymore. Maybe so. But what, were you a, like a, a little like local celebrity when you had your newspaper strip? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, I, I used to get recognized uh, on the on the subway. Um, well, used to. I mean, it happened like three or four times. Yeah, that's good. So and once when I was like walking down the street. So, yeah, it was weird. I mean, I, I like reveled in it, you know, because I have a massive ego, so. Would you, would you get like bands that are like, we do our poster, stuff like that? No, I didn't. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think like my style like appealed to a lot of the hipsters, which was sort of the weird dichotomy because mm -hmm. I was tagged as this like, you know, hipster artist, like slacker. He's like, you know, writing about slackers. Uh -huh. But yet, you know, it's like my style is this, you know, I was trying to be Rembrandt, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't trying to be, you know, um, I don't know, uh, like somebody psychedelic, like I, 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 I was trying to think of like some zap artist and like they immediately just all like vanished from my brain. Were you, did you do any record covers? Have you ever done any of that stuff? Uh, no. See, no, I mean, I'm like my illustration work is like very like thin and almost like non-existent. I mean, yeah, me too. You know, I don't do any illustration work ever. Yeah. I mean, like I don't, I don't pursue it. Mm -hmm. so like that's part of it but it's just but like illustration but like the way that i draw isn't like friendly to like what's like popular in illustration especially like corporate illustration now i mean it's all you know it's all like f like flat color and like line you know right. yeah do you you know eric reynolds said this thing about how like when there was a time like in i think 2000 when it seemed like all of a sudden alternative comics were finally going to be given their shot in like the mainstream culture uh, because like alternative comics had figured out like the graphic novel and that was getting mainstream attention and like in, in write-ups and stuff. And they're like, all right, this is great. Like, finally, this is going to pay off and this, we're going to be taken seriously. He said, and then the Spider-Man movie came out <laughs> <laughs> and then Marvel and DC started reissuing their old comics as graphic novels. And, and then, cause, cause you know, Fantagraphics and the, the alternative co uh, companies had gotten bookstores to devote a section called graphic novels to what they were doing. And then Marvel and DC flooded those sections with their shitty reprints that they were calling graphic novels. Yeah. And like, that was like the end of it. And then, they, and then like a little bit later, Chris Ware, you know, and, and Dan Cloud, all those guys released, it was okay. So it was like Jimmy Corrigan, uh, David Boring and Black Hole came out like around the same time. And Persepolis too. Yeah, and Persepolis. And all of a sudden it was like, boom, like, okay, this is it. This is going to be a, a medium for adults again. Right. And then something happened. And I think it was the Marvel movies. And then also the fact that, you know, so every newspaper came out, they said like, comics aren't just for kids anymore. That became the joke. And they, they were trying to get that stick in people's heads. 
but then YA started selling really well, better mm-hmm. than the graphic novels were. So now, yeah. so now it's like yeah. comics are just for kids after all, you know? It's yeah, like, of course. No, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Well, I mean, I think that's just, that's just the country in general, you know, I mean, everyone's pretty infantilized. So yeah, that's for sure. Definitely. So it's, it's, you know, there isn't that adult like literary market that there was, you it know, it started like, though. Like, but it started like in the early 2000s, there was like this era when there was like McSweeney's, you know, there was like This American Life. There was kind of this hip literary thing going on and graphic novels were became a, a part of that. And then yeah. something happened to it. People just got bored with it or something. I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe it's just the work. I mean, maybe there just wasn't like another breakout work like those. I mean, you know, it's all cyclical. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe that's our job. We need to do something, you know, highbrow and like you know, some sort of fictional thing that'll yeah. capture uh, that that imagination. <laughs> well, see, that was going to be my next question was like, do you think that it's that it's cartoonist job to to save cartooning and like to save graphic novels and, and turn it into a um, like an actual career or industry? Like, is that up to us to do that, to kind of force this? what like on the on the like the literary end like on the just we're on the ground floor here like something like this youtube channel for example like the whole point of this is to to um shine a light to just give more attention to the kind of graphic novels this the scene that i'm in you know because tom spurgeon's dead you know what i mean like yeah every time there's like a, a platform for the stuff that we do it, it it goes away or whatever and nothing replaces it so it's like after a while i'm like well, maybe I need to be something that replaces it. Like maybe like other, maybe my friends need to do this. Cause like, we need to keep talking about what we're doing. So it's not, we're not ignored and this thing doesn't die, you know? Yeah, I agree. And like the sense of like community is definitely important. And um, I, I think that you're doing great work with this channel, which is why I reached out to you. Cause I wanted to, you know, be a, be a part of this because I think, yeah, after Tom died, that it was such like a massive gaping hole for like, you know, everyone. Yeah. So it, it um, yeah, I mean, we, we like definitely need, yeah, more pot. I mean, you know, like you and like the kayfabe and um, I mean, I guess like Kate Skelly has something too. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, that's, that's, that's probably what it's, it's gonna turn into. Right, um, we have to kind of support each other. Yeah, I mean, well, like that's that's all Tom like wanted, anyways. I think you know, I think he just wanted us to just give each other encouragement and you know, just you know, make sure that we were all staying safe and you know, like producing work that was the you know best of our abilities. I guess. I mean, you know, really, he was just a, like a cheerleader. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but. Um, yeah, like, it's, I mean, it, it's like hard to like replicate like what he was able to do because he, you know, he was able to sort of go into all different, you know, all different realms of the comics world. Yeah. You know, right. Just us, but. Um, I mean, think about, like, I, mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's just, huh? Oh, I was just going to say there was like other, back then too, like in the early 2000s, you had, uh, you had like journalists too who were, taking what those artists were doing seriously too. And they were writing for real outlets about what they were doing and stuff. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm um, like Douglas Wolk. Like he was somebody that was like writing a lot. I mean, you know, he like still is. I mean, like now there's like a lot of PH, I mean, there's like, you know, people who have like PhDs and like comics now, you know, so like there's serious like um, academic work being, you know, going on that like didn't exist like 20 years ago. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely like moving in that direction again, but like maybe just like on the academic side. I mean, like, you know, we don't see it commercially, but I'm sure we will. I mean, it's all it's all cyclical. It's, it's just going to take like one or two books again, you know, like a David Boring or yeah, Jimmy Corrigan, you know. The next um, Mill Ferris book, whenever that comes out. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, like she's, you know, articulate, you know, unlike me. And, you know, she can, <laughs> you know, be like a great spokesperson for, for that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I love listening to Emil talk. Actually, I was, do you know, uh, Tim Kreider? It's not important, but. 
She's yes. a, um, so um, we're old friends and uh, we were emailing and he's like obsessed with uh, Stanley Kubrick. And actually I can show you. So um, about 10 years ago, um, I forgot the publisher, but they like released the script to uh, Kubrick's lost film on Napoleon. Oh, cool. So Tim is a massive Kubrick fan and he took issue with this uh, printing of the script and just completely like disagreed with like what they were trying to do with it. You know, they were trying to like construct what the film probably would have looked like. So Tim did his own version oh, and wow. he like said it to me and it's nuts, but it's like a really great script. And we were emailing and um, I like got the idea that it would probably make like a great graphic novel. Yeah, you know? I agree. So, but you know, he was like, well, I'm sure someone like has the rights to it and like, they're not gonna, <laughs> they're not gonna give them yeah. up. But like, you know, it, it would be like this like epic, I mean, because you know, it's like this big subject and it's this, this like sweeping like narrative, you know? I mean, it would be like perfect graphic novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a cool project. It'd be cool if you could do it in two volumes. Yeah. The slip case <laughs> <laughs> right it's, that's such a giant you know that's a, like i finished my joseph smith book and it's 450 pages and i was oh, yeah. i'm like i'm never doing anything like this again yeah. or like this is my big book and from now on i'm doing things that are like 200 pages at most how do you did you uh when you worked on penny like did you have it all scripted out or did you go as you went along uh a little bit of both um well because it, it's just a collection of scripts so um, a lot of it was improvised, mm -hmm. um, but there were a couple of stories that, you know, like the longer stories were, were scripted out. Is the last page of Penny the last page that you drew for the book, or did you like do stuff that you thought this would be better in the middle of it? Oh yeah, no, it's it's all over the place. I mean, that's the way I work, anyways. So you figure out the structure later. No, I mean, I, I figure out the structure first, but then I just, you know. Um, well, like this new project, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, working on a, like a different page. Well, um, a page from a different scene, like every, every day, just so I don't get bored, you know, drawing the same people over and over again. Yeah. But, but it, it's all scripted out and all thumbnailed. I mean, it's, you know, it's given a script and I like thumbnailed it all out. And then yeah. I have these little tabs for like, you know, who I want to model for like each of the characters. And I go and shoot them. It's, it's very, like, you know, labor-intensive thing. So, you know. But how long does that take you to do that? That part of the process, like the thumbnailing. Yes, the thumbnails. That took about uh, two months, maybe. To thumbnail thumbnail out a whole book. Yeah. Holy shit, man. Yeah, because I mean, you know, it's they're they're just really. I mean, it's it's a very dense. Uh, project I mean there's like a lot going on like each page and it's all about the way it's it, it's I mean it's it's supposed to be very like cinematic so like I'm thinking a lot about um like how to tell the story in a way that's similar to a movie so it's there, there's all these like storytelling problems that go into it so I, I have to make the thumbnails as detailed as possible in order to achieve that because when I set up my models you know, I have to make sure that it's like pretty close to like how it looks in the thumbnails. So, but like, you know, sometimes like when I'm setting them up, you know, there'll be like certain lighting that like I didn't anticipate or I'll get like another idea. So then, you know, I'll take like better references and, it, it, you know, like in the end it, it becomes like a collage sort of improvisational thing. So, but then, you know, sometimes I'll just like throw out the photos completely and I'll just, you know, draw it out of my head. I mean, you know, really, they just kind of serve as like a, well, I mean, as a reference. Yeah. So is, is the story a three act structure? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I had a big problem with when I was doing my book is I was like, there's an, I can't fit this into like a three act thing. Like each chapter kind of had to be its own. Basically, what got me over that was like, this could be like, I'm going to structure it like a Netflix mini series instead, where like mm -hmm. each part is its own story. You know, like each part has its own problems that yeah. need to be resolved by the end of it. And That's a good idea. You know, carry over to the next one. So, yeah. 
that's what we should be doing moving forward with our own writing mm -hmm. is just thinking about thinking of it as like a netflix miniseries right you know, yeah. each, like each chapter isn't is an episode mm -hmm. yeah so, i mean like that's my thinking now like what i mean i've I, I, i've been writing this story about that's semi-autobiographical that I've, I've finally been able to um it's it's from like the darkest period of the drinking days but like i, I like really want to do it I've, I've been thinking about it for a long time um but I, I just started writing it but i'm like writing it in that in that structure cool. so and you know i find it i find it kind of liberating in a way because um instead of not knowing what's going to happen next i mean I, I know that like i have to get to a certain point in order to like hit all these beats so it's it's easier for me to like structure the story if i know that i'm, I'm working towards a certain beat mm -hmm. so do you have a publisher for this book you're working on now oh, no oh wait the one that i just thumbnailed yeah yeah oh yeah yeah i do well the contracts are actually i'm supposed to get them today so okay and how much of the book did you have to show them before you uh, not much. I mean, it was the um, writer, um, or the the writers are connected to. I mean, I don't even know how much I should say. Okay. But, but they have like a lot of they have like a lot of influence, and they were able to use that influence to just get the deal done. So like I had to do like, you know, a few pages. So. Yeah. Cool, man. But I mean, they're they're not. Um, you know, they're, uh, fuck, I can't even, <laughs> I like, want to tell you so bad, but like, I can't. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about it. If you draw about people that win all of the time, you're drawing only about minorities.